Thanks so much everyone for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology, activists uh, for here for Elite Forward in Medicine. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. There's a lot of community happening tonight. I want to say welcome uh, to all of the communities that are watching at home. This ecosystem that has been set up by the meetup groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network that we are looking to develop. And it all revolves around you. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your host, James Masco. Hello and welcome to the Functional Forum. This month we are here in Hollywood, Florida for the annual international conference of the Institute for Functional Medicine. And this year's topic is autoimmune disease, which is such a hot topic due to one, a massive increase in prevalence, and two, not that many sustainable solutions out there in conventional medicine. You're going to be hearing from some of the top clinicians, researchers, academics, and practitioners on the front lines who are helping to reverse and prevent autoimmune disease. And we're going to have all of the top highlights for you from the conference right now. So before we get into the conference content, I just wanted to thank all of you who voted for the first annual Evolution of Medicine Awards that we hosted just a few doors down from the hotel here in Hollywood, Florida. I'd like to give a special shout out to my Evolution of Medicine team who were there, who brought the whole event together. I know many of you have interacted with them through the Practice Accelerator and through our meetup groups all over the world, and they put on a great show. And it was a really beautiful night and event, great to see so many faces but I'm sure that many of you at home are keen to know who won the awards. So the first award of the night was the Behind the Scenes Award and that was awarded to the IFM staff for putting on so many events all around the world. The nominees for the Practice Technology Award were Fullscript, Living Matrix, MDHQ, Practice Better and the Patient Acquisition Funnel and the winner was Fullscript. The nominees for Media of the Year were Mike Mutzel for High Intensity Health, Broken Brain by Dr. Mark Hyman, BBC One's Doctor in the House from Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, The New Frontiers in Functional Medicine podcast from Dr. Cara Fitzgerald, and Holistic Primary Care from Eric Goldman. And the winner was Doctor in the House, Dr. Rangan Chatterjee. The nominees for Researcher of the Year were Dr. Dale Bredesen, Dr. Mark Hyman and Patrick Hannaway from the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Terry Walls, Dr. Joe Pizzorna, and Dr. Atha Ali. And the winner was Dr. Dale Bredesen. The nominees for Practice Model Innovation include Tom Blue for the Practice Survey and Lead Health, Dr. Sachin Patel for the Living Proof Institute, Dr. Robin Burzin for Parsley Health, Chris Moore for the Nordic Clinics, and Dr. Lara Salia for the Group Matrix Intake. And the winner of the Practice Model Innovation was Dr. Robin Burzin for Parsley Health. The nominees for Book of the Year were Dirty Genes by Dr. Ben Lynch, Hashimoto's Protocol by Dr. Isabella Wentz, The End of Alzheimer's by Dr. Dale Bredesen, The Toxin Solution by Dr. Joe Pizzorno, and The Autoimmune Fix by Dr. Tom O'Brien. And the winner of this year's award was Dr. Isabella Wentz for Hashimoto's Protocol. And the winner of Community Builder of the Year went to Dr. Kelly Brogan. And the final award of the night was for Educator of the Year. And the nominees were Dr. Mark Hyman from the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, Dr. Robert Luby, the Executive Director of Education for the Institute for Functional Medicine, Tracy Harrison from the School of Applied Functional Medicine, Chris Kresser from the Kresser Institute, and Andrea Nakayama from the Functional Nutrition Lab. And the winner was Dr. Robert Luby. So last year's topic at the annual international conference was reversing cognitive decline. It came at the perfect time when Dr. Dale Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's came out, and there was so much wisdom coming from the functional medicine community as it related to brain disorders. 
arguably even more than that is autoimmune disease. And there have been so many luminaries in the functional medicine space contributing to a new understanding of autoimmune disease. So in order to go deep into what that looks like from the functional medicine perspective, we sat down with the head of education for the IFM, the winner of the Educator of the Year Award, Dr. Robert Luby, for this interview. All right, so we are here with the Executive Director of Medical Education for the Institute for Functional Medicine and recent Educator of the Year Award, Dr. Robert Luby. Doc, first of all, thanks so much for all your great work. You know, the feedback from the practitioner community is just that you go above and beyond to create an exceptional education experience here at the IFM and a, a very worthy winner. You know, last year uh, we had just, just this amazing timing between um, you know so much uh, focus on functional medicine strategies for neurodegeneration and the topic of the annual conference it seems like uh, this year might even be be more so with autoimmune disease the timing of autoimmune disease is very important I'd like to just circle back to this award James if I might <laughs> obviously it's a team award it's not an individual award as I see it for IFM but I would also like to say that the focus of IFM historically was to train clinicians in the functional medicine model and <clears throat> what we've got now is a whole ecosystem. And if we, are, if we maintain our success training clinicians, you're going to have even more categories of awards to give out at future <laughs> EVO awards. That's my goal now as an educator, to have more categories of awards to give out for the functional medicine ecosystem. Well, there's a lot to celebrate, isn't there? There is. Yeah. But back to the, the timing of autoimmunity, yes, it, the timing is right because uh, the healthcare expense incurred by autoimmunity is just skyrocketing. And autoimmunity, the prevalence, is also skyrocketing. Uh, so it, it couldn't be a better time for this topic because functional medicine has the answers for how to treat this in a safe and effective way and hopefully a cost-effective way as well. Absolutely. When you started to put together the sort of speaker lineup, uh, who were the, the people that you were most excited to sort of get on board? Right. Well, internationally, you have to look at Yehuda Schoenfeld. I mean, yeah. he is the internationally recognized luminary in autoimmune disease. And then you, if you look domestically, we've got Leonard Calabrese at Cleveland Clinic. We've got uh, Ronan Rosenblum from Harvard. We've got Alessio Fasano. I guess he's a li little Italian international, but also mass general. So yeah. we've got a, an incredible domestic lineup. And even within the IFM community, there's Helen Messier, uh, Robert Roundtree, Patrick Hannaway, uh, Terry Walls, We've got recognizable names in the functional medicine community who are also giants in, in autoimmunity. When you start to talk to you know, people in, in uh, sort of conventional autoimmune diseases, are these concepts sort of making their way in uh, to there? Slowly, not, not quickly enough. And if you think about the, the upstream triggers of autoimmunity, they tend to be lifestyle factors, choices, antigens that we ex get exposed to, the environment, the gut, the microbiome, everything we're talking about. In fact, things that historically IFM accelerated into the mainstream. If you think about the importance of the gut health, the microbiome health, food antigens, things of that nature. So it's all now coming together, those uh, initial things that IFM accelerated into upstream causes of the current focus of our annual conference this year, autoimmunity. Absolutely. So when you, I know you hear from a lot of clinicians that come to these trainings and, and start to, who are now implementing these ideas in clinical practice, where do you find that, that clinicians sort of have um, the most either like stumbling blocks or most success? I think the most stumbling blocks would be in, in uh, incorporating systems into their office to make these kinds of changes, to switch away from the model of just a pharmaceutical prescription into programs and a way of, of really uh, approaching the clinical encounter in a way that gets people motivated to change. Uh, you could include the group visit model in this as, as an innovation that really helps get individuals changing their lifestyle, things that would have an impact on autoimmunity. So it's, it's all those kinds of things, the, the challenges of the, of the clinical day and the healthcare system challenges of the short visits and, and the administrative tasks that get in the way of making innovations that would actually allow you to motivate patients and get them to make the changes they need. And then um, how, does, how do the learnings of, say, this kind of conference end up infiltrating into the, you know, the modules? Like, I know there's a whole immune module in IFM, right? Right. We, we certainly do. We, we uh, contribute from the modules to the annual conference, but even more importantly, from the annual conference back to the modules. We count on the annual conference every year to inform new material in all of the advanced practice modules, new material in the certification curriculum. It's one of the 
accelerators of the emerging concepts, which we, you know, that's in our strategic plan, but the annual conference is designed to do that to improve the curriculum. I know there are, there are people here at this conference this weekend who are coming from major medical institutions, GI doctors, immune doctors coming in and, and sort of looking at this. It must be quite a responsibility to be able to sort of present um, this information in a context that uh, is, is, is palatable to those people who may not have come across many of these concepts. Is that a, a key part of your role? It is. The, the audience is broad and as an educator, one of the first principles is who is your audience? And the audience is so broad here, the educational challenge is enormous because we have people from uh, the conventional healthcare setting and they're, they're familiar with certain ways of doing things and we have people who are innovators and early adopters in functional medicine who are very comfortable with a different level of comfort. So there's always the issue of the cutting edge and the bleeding edge and walking that fine line of responsibly presenting the evidence but also taking on the, uh, the responsibility too in the ecosystem. We understand we have to be the accelerator of change in the healthcare system and that means taking these emerging concepts that are scientifically, scientifically plausible even at an early stage of evidence and translating them to the conventional healthcare system in a way that will be palatable. I love that challenge as an educator. Absolutely. You know, one of the things you mentioned earlier was, was the Cleveland Clinic and, and Dr. Calabresi and, and other things here. I remember last year at the end of, on the last slide, on the last event, they had that sort of interim results of the Cleveland Clinic. And right on the right hand side was the autoimmune. And it's actually probably the most striking sort of differential for functional medicine versus conventional with cost and, and outcomes. Um, you know, I think a lot of people feel that the autoimmune disease might be sort of a, an opportunity for functional medicine to really make it into the mainstream. Is that, do you, do you hold that and you share that? I do, and if you think of the, the audiences there that need to hear this, it's patients will hear about it word of mouth, largely. Yeah. They'll hear about it in social media with people blogging about their success with functional medicine and, and their autoimmune disease, for example. Clinicians need to see the evidence, so we yeah. need to generate the evidence in those trials, such as you mentioned the interim results in the Cleveland Clinic study. And then we need to attract the, the attention of payers, so we need to demonstrate that functional medicine approach to autoimmunity will uh, develop or will result in better health outcomes, but also at a lower cost, and those trials are underway. So I think we have to influence all three of those audiences, and then I think the results will be inevitable. There will be an uptake in scale. Absolutely. I mean, we're already seeing, in, in terms of just the dietary side of things, you see things like the autoimmune paleo movement as an example, where you know t tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are getting on board with some of the sort of dietary uh, ideas that Dr. Walls and, and so forth are, are talking about. You know, it's it's important to be able to sort of give them a medical home where they feel understood. Right. Yeah. Hope is so important for anybody who's suffering, struggling with a chronic disease, and especially if they've been through some fairly rigorous treatments and not found the success they hoped. And that's what we hope to provide those patients uh, who come to functional medicine practitioners, is the, not just the outcomes, but the hope that leads to those outcomes. That's part of the key of getting them to those outcomes. Absolutely. So, you know, all the way through the conference, we've been capturing uh, tips from practitioners who are listening to the content or doing this in clinical practice. I know you're mainly an educator these days, but a physician. Um, if you had to offer tips to our practitioner community about how to replicate some of the great work and the science that's been delivered here, what are some of your, uh, your tips for the community? You know, the, one of the most important things is uh, what we've heard today over and over in this first day is when you're sitting down to eat, sit down to eat and eat for your microbiota. Eat for those bacteria. They want to take care of their home. Our bodies are their home. If you focus on that as a clinician as your first principle, you're going to make some inroads and you'll get some buy-in from your patients because that change alone will help people start to feel better. Okay, so we've had you know a number of consecutive hits here with the annual conference. Can you give us any tips as to what to expect in 2019? 2019, we are pleased to announce that we have another very timely topic. It's going to be addiction, stress, and pain, and the interplay of those three topics coming together. And we know that's a big problem in yeah. America and in the world right now. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for all the great work. It's been an amazing uh, conference to be part of. I know that everyone is equally inspired and empowered by the information and uh, you'll see the ripple effects moving through the uh, medical ecosystem. Thanks, James. And let's keep on this responsibility of stewarding the functional medicine ecosystem. Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
So if you have been following us for a while here at the Evolution of Medicine, you know that in under a month's time, we are taking the show on the road. Having built out so many meetup groups over the last few years all across the country, we decided to take the show on the road and come to 22 cities around the country to be able to share functional medicine with people who can really take it to the masses. Employers, insurance companies, and other organizations that want this type of care for their patients. It's going to be a really exciting time. I'm literally getting in a bus with my family and driving around for four months, and I hope to see you somewhere along the tour. Now, we have partnered with Precision Analytical, makers of the Dutch Test, to provide free tickets to anyone who wants to come. If you go to goevomed.com slash tour, go to one of the Eventbrites and put in the code DUTCH, that's with a capital D, D-U-T-C-H, you'll be able to get free tickets to come with yourself, your family, your friends, anyone in your practice to come down and be part of the community. You're going to hear from integrative and functional medicine leaders in the local community. You're going to hear from activists and people on the cutting edge. And we're going to do a functional forum style show to rally the community around functional medicine as a solution for chronic disease. I really hope you can join us, check out the tour dates, and we'll see you on the tour. Hey, my name is Dr. Titus Chu. I am a best-selling author of Brain Save, the six-week plan to heal your brain from concussions, brain injuries, and trauma without drugs or surgery. And my one-minute tip comes from a personal place of actually suffering from multiple head injuries myself and from being a really busy practitioner in practice. So my one-minute tip is for you practitioners out there. It's called the Brain Save Mini Break. And as you guys probably know, in practice, being super busy, like I'm seeing patients back to back, nonstop, super focused and going in, doing all the things that I do. And I started to burn out. Like for years, I'd work for hours, like five, eight, ten hours straight seeing patients. And I learned that I couldn't continue doing that. So I started to do these brain save mini breaks which is based on this idea of the ultradian rhythms. So you guys know about the circadian rhythms, which is every 24 hours. The ultradian rhythms, on the other hand, they run about every 60 to 90 minutes. And every 60 to 90 minutes, we go through these cycles where we have a lot of energy, a lot of focus, but then around the 90 minute mark, we start to crash. And if you guys are like me or were like, was like me, I used to just go through that, but at the expense of my brain. Uh, activating the HPA access, triggering cortisol, adrenal adrenaline release. So what the brain save mini break is, after every 60 to 90 minutes, you can just set in your alarm clock just to take a break. Or what I've done is I've just built into my schedule to take a, either a five or 30 minute break where I really don't do anything. And that's the key. It can't involve, involve any type of mental energy or focus. So it could be somebody just closing my eyes and rubbing my eyeballs, stretching or yawning. And then you'd be surprised by doing that just for a little bit. You'll be supercharged to go for the rest of the 5, 8, 10 hour workday. Hi everybody, I'm Holly Ladd and I'm a functional medicine certified health coach and my tip for you today is to find a functional medicine certified health coach to partner with. As we're learning here today, especially in the case of autoimmunity, lifestyle factors play in big time and a health coach can really help your patient implement and that's where we're seeing the big gap is between uh, what to do and actually doing it and that's where a health coach can step in and give your client and patient practical steps to implement a lifestyle plan that will hopefully uh, reverse their autoimmunity and help them feel better. Hi everybody, I'm Melissa Beeman, I'm a nurse practitioner. Just recently moved to Colorado, so I'm living right outside of Denver. I have two tips, I'll see if I can squeeze them in. Um, first of all, I think community is huge. Some of these lifestyle changes that we personally have to make and that we ask you to make are really hard, so if you can find people who are like-minded and support you, I totally recommend that. Another thing is what I like to call positive self-talk um, or our positive feedback loop on our brain. I think another way to say this is mindfulness, but essentially when you are tempted to fall back into old habits that are very tempting at times, um, I think we can use the positive reinforcement of how we feel well or better, whether it's mind, emotions, physical 
when we follow functional medicine protocols, I think we can use that to remind ourselves to stick to that plan. So I, I like to do that for myself. I teach that to my patients. It's this, this conversation in your head. Focus on the positive thoughts. Hey, this is Dr. Patrick Hanaway. I'm the research director at the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. Also in practice with my wife at Family to Family in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm here at the annual international conference and had the great opportunity to interview and talk with uh, Dr. Alessio Fasano. And the thing that he said that made the biggest difference to me in terms of our immune system, the biggest boost that you can have for immune system is to be able to laugh at yourself. That is, don't take yourself so seriously. Let's look at what's happening in our life and our world and the opportunities that we have and let's help our patients. Let's not be too serious focus on what's going on with them, but actually bring some joy and happiness into our practices because that's going to help our immune systems and it's going to help our patients. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. For the next interview, I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Dr. Alessio Fasano. He is a pediatric gastroenterologist at Mass General and has contributed incredibly to the areas of celiac disease and autoimmune disease. And we sat down with him for this interview. So we are very excited to make his debut on the Functional Forum, Dr. Alessio Fasano. Welcome, Dr. and thanks for, for being here on the show. So this is the first time you've been on the Functional Forum. So for those people who uh, don't know about your work, can you give us, maybe start with sort of a five minute or an overview of uh, sort of where you've, uh, where you've been and, and what you've, your, your work? So, yeah, sure. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist by training and for almost the entire professional career been an interest in actually I should say fascinated um, on how microbes cross talk with us. Of course I'm interested in this cross talk on the GI tract because you know my background. Um, and you know over the years this interest moved from understanding why we got you know diarrheal disease that you know still kill a lot of kids worthwhile uh, to the much more complex ecosystem in the microbiome. And one of the things that I'm very much interested in is how the composition function of this, you know, ecosystem can change the trafficking of molecules, particularly antigen, from the environment into our body, and so doing change this balance between tolerance, I used to say healthy, or the induce an immune response that leads to inflammation. And therefore, you know, the interest is also in chronic inflammatory disease, particularly now the immunity, and that's the reason why I've been invited to, to this meeting. Absolutely, I know you've been, um, you know, very uh, involved with understanding autoimmune disease and this sort of new paradigm of autoimmune disease for the GI doctors and internal medicine doctors who sort of aren't up on the science. What are people learning here that is crucial to understand the the genesis of autoimmunity and how it displays in all these different labels that it's given? Yeah, I mean, I believe that two major lessons for what I heard today, and again, we're almost the, just at the beginning of this three days marathon. Um, there's already transformation, I should say. One, that, you know, the old paradigm that uh, autoimmunity is the results of, um, you know, gene environment interaction is it, it, reductive. So absolutely genes and environment are important and necessary, but not sufficient. There are other elements at play. Um, and specifically, at least the other three elements. Um, so, again, gut permeability allows these two worlds that in general are segregated because genes that live in our body and this molecule that keep a bay outside that can physically interact. Uh, the immune system, that of course, is doing something wrong because, you know, um, fire this uh, chronic inflammation. And then, of course, the microbiome and its composition and function that seems to dictate you know, the switch between genetic predisposition to clinical actuality by epigenetically, you know, changing if and when the genes that we have are expressed or, you know, suppressed. And this, you know, balance of expression, you know, um, repression may be the ones that create the perfect storm to move from predisposition to clinical actuality. So that's pretty much the very the most important lesson that I learned today. The second, and again, this is something that I felt for a long time, um, and it's not accepted whatsoever yeah. uh, by the um, general uh, view, particularly classical immunologists, that, you know, I do not think that, you know, autoimmunity is a one-way street, so that when you break tolerance, that's it. There is nothing you can do because now the disease goes in automatic. 
if you find a way to stop this interplay uh, between the environment and the genes <clears throat> by affecting one of these five pillars, i.e., you know, the epigenetic, so target your genetic, you know, makeup, or, um, you know, the environment, or the gut permeability, or the way the immune system works, or the composition function yeah. of the microbiome, <clears throat> you can, you know, eventually stop inflammation. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, 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 a chronic inflammatory process that leads to autoimmunity would be such a nonsense, evolution speaking, that if this was indeed, as we believe, the results of some mutation that happened a long time ago that puts the immune system in on, automatic, and you can't switch off anymore, I don't see the evolutionary advantage of such a mutation that will have been wiped up by evolution. <clears throat> Not only we didn't see, you know, uh, the, the elimination of autoimmunity, but now we're on a rampage of it. So clearly there is something else at play here. So the immune system that is chronically creating inflammation is probably doing its job the, the way that was programmed because it's instigated somehow yeah. to fight. Um, so I believe that now the opportunity is to understand what we're doing in terms of changing the environment to keep the immune system so belligerent and once we find out what are we doing, how are we going to fix it? Is that thinking process one of the reasons why you are sort of somewhat attracted to this functional medicine community as a sort of a partner to your research work? But see, I, I have a, a different kind of a mental attitude. I have intellectual curiosity yeah. and I have as a primary goal that would never change um, my focus, the well-being of the patients that I take care of, whatever it takes. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that I'm a, you know, total supportive of functional medicine versus, you know, you know, conventional evidence medicine based medicine or vice versa. I don't see, by the way, this as one op opposite to the other, but I see them to really bring to the table a different perspective that is, will be useful to integrate, actually, because, you know, some of the integrated medicine, you know, and functional medicine approach may not explain everything yeah. uh, and needs some support from the evidence-based medicine and vice versa. There are so many things that in terms of, you know, conventional, you know, based evidence-based medicine, we can't explain. Yeah. And, you know, functional medicine can bring on the table the missing piece. Yeah. So I, I don't see this as one alternative to the other. Do you see those, th those things coming together in, 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 uh, in the academic setting anyway? I do, actually. Uh, you know, we see more and more institutions, including the one that I work at MGH, and with their functional medicine, you know, departments um, that are nicely integrated with other departments to, uh, you know, trying to answer questions that they still, you know, are, you know, puzzling us. Uh, again, um, you know, I, I don't like extreme attitudes. so. If there is an evidence-based uh, scientist or clinician that works by dogma, say it has to be my way or no way, I am always very worried about that kind of attitude. And vice versa, you know, a functional medicine doctor say everything can be fixed with this easy fix and it has to be that way, that also worries me. Uh, but, you know, again, if we have the humility and the humble approach to question ourselves all the time, and to be mentally flexible um, and keep, uh, you know, as our primary t target and not to prove ourselves right, yeah. but, you know, to achieve the best that we can for our patients, everybody will win. I know that you, you're aware of the fact that um, the functional medicine community or certain elements have, have used your research the way to say no gluten for anyone at any time. Can you clarify your sort of thoughts on that? Because I know that that's something that's contentious uh, in your mind as well as in the clinical practice of other people. Well, again, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, when uh, you take, you know, science or discoveries and you put this out of context that they can really be brought to that element of extreme statements that I was, you know, criticized a moment ago. So um, if you ask yourself, uh, does gluten and, and with some of its component create problems in terms of, let's say, increased gut permeability in everybody? The answer is yes, for sure. But to go from there and say, then the reason why everybody needs to be gluten-free because this increased permeability will be a problem for everybody, that is something that there is no 
uh, really, you know, evidence. Uh, the vast majority of us, as a matter of fact, would not have any consequences, probably. Yeah. It's a good thing because that help the, this process of learning the environment, what we call antigen sampling, to determine energy and therefore tolerance. There is a group of individuals that unfortunately, this same mechanism that increases gut permeability will have clinical consequences. Yeah. But these are the people that, beside having gluten increased gut permeability, they must have other genetic makeups that will make gluten to be mishandled, to increase the inflammatory process, to become a chronic inflammation and develop a problem. That can be severe disease if you are predisposed for an autoimmune disease. It can be weed allergies if you are predisposed for an allergic disease. Or it can be this new entity for which we don't know that much yet uh, that is called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So I know you're giving two keynotes over the weekend here. Um, for the practitioners that haven't made it here this weekend around the world, are there a couple of uh, tips or, or things that you shared in those lectures that you'd like to share with a wider group? Well, first of all, I'm sorry for you because not only missing this, my talks, but many others that I believe it was worthwhile to be here. Yeah. Um, but I will say that, you know, the home tech messages for my opening lecture that was trying to capture the three days content of what's going to be discussed today is this is really a transformational time in the science of autoimmunity. So we really need to start thinking in a very different way. Um, maybe that we don't have the solution now, but now at least we see the light at the end of the tunnel of what can be done uh, by manipulating microbiota uh, in any shape or form that we can that can mitigate that epigenetic pressure that keep the autoimmune process ongoing. So that would be, you know, my first message. How are we going to do that? You know, again, uh, probably changing the, our attitude in terms of nutrition that has been probably the most impactful factor that has been driving this chronic inflammation would be the low hanging fruit. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure that, you know, the more we learn about what composition and function of microbiota has created the problem, the more we will have other ammunition like, you know, specific probiotics or postbiotics or symbiotics or prebiotics. The other thing is that again, um, you know, uh, another message that it goes to the second lecture that has to do with gluten related disorders is, you know, again, if you go absolute and you make claims that, you know, everybody will be sick if they eat gluten, you will defy in the light of, you know, lay people uh, like, you know, talk shows that make fun of the gluten-free diet and healthcare professional, something that is extremely important for those that have the medical necessity to be gluten-free. You know, I keep saying that the gluten-free diet for celiacs, it's like insulin for diabetics. I would never make fun of somebody that has to take insulin because he or she has diabetes. I, I think that, you know, people with celiac disease deserve the same respect when they have to embrace a gluten-free diet for medical necessity. So the risk in generalizing, you know, the good or the bad of any kind of intervention, in this case in the gluten-free diet, is really to harm the people that they really need that the most. Yeah. Um, and I'm open in mind enough to say that, you know, I wouldn't dispute that, for example, other autoimmune diseases like MS, rheumatoid arthritis, or, you know, uh, type 1 diabetes can benefit from the gluten-free diet. But contrary to celiac disease in which everybody does, I think that there we talk about a subgroup of individuals, yeah. you know, talk about personalized medicine this is so dear to functional medicine. The challenge that we face right now is to identify that subgroup by having biomarkers that will say of these 100 people with diabetes or MS, those 20 may benefit from gluten-free diet yeah. and then implement the diet only on them. And then you see the effect that will be obvious to everybody. Yeah. And you would not vilify a, an intervention that, you know, if given to everybody, will have a 20% efficacy and people will scream and yell, I told you so. Yeah. It doesn't work, but if you stratify, that is 100% efficacy. If you give that diet to only the 20% of people that will benefit for that. So those are, in my humble opinion, you know, the two messages. And if I can close with something else that is a common sense, you know, we're still in a learning process. You know, it would be a disaster if we try to rush to the process and try to run before, you know, learning to walk by making these new discoveries 
immediately implementable on the clinical ground. We will get there. Yeah. Um, but you know, you look at the you know, probiotic industry that is ballooning, yeah. trying to modify the microbiome, but we don't know exactly what we're trying to modify, totally. um, but we will. Yeah. You know. Well, well, thank you so much for all of your time and effort and, you know, all the work that you, you've done. I know it's inspired so many, I know it's informed so many, and I know uh, with the passion that you have and the intellectual curiosity, you're just getting started. Thank you so much. Right. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Mette. I'm the founder of MyMe. We are a digital therapeutics company rethinking autoimmunity. I'm here presenting the lupus study results. Um, lupus was originally thought of as a genetic disease. Uh, but it was 90% women, two-thirds were black or Hispanic. And what we're seeing now is that it's jumping categories. So we have white, men, young, old getting the disease. So there's clearly an environmental component. Um, blood work might give an indication of what is wrong, but it doesn't tell us anything about the environment that goes into producing it. So what we're looking at here is identifying triggers through understanding the lifestyle and environmental components of what is making these patients sick. Um, the original study was 18 lupus patients with severe and moderate disease. All 18 of them had improvement in their quality of life. Um, eight of them decreased or went off all of their meds. And 10 out of the 18 were unable to work going into the 16-week intervention. Out of these 10, four returned to work immediately after. So my position is that it's possible to reverse complex chronic disease by simple measures. My name is Dane Johnson and my story, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease as a young man and I was able to heal myself using natural medicine despite what my local doctors had told me. And my biggest tip to practitioners out there who are trying to be a service to their clients is to be relatable and personalize their regimen to their specific lifestyle and needs. The more they feel like they can relate with what you've been through, the more they're going to trust that you have the answers for them. Hi, I'm Lisa Gold, and today I would like to remind you of something that's helped me over the years, and that is the art of listening. When you have someone sitting in front of you, try to remember the importance of eye contact, of listening to voice intonations, listening to their stories, looking at their body language. As you are doing this, your brain is actually picking up on billions of cues that you're not really aware of. In addition, you're creating the foundation for a therapeutic, a therapeutic relationship with that patient. You're establishing um, that, that dance that you'll be doing over many months together and you'll be providing something for that person that they may never have received, your entire presence and your compassion. That will make a huge difference in their healing and the relationship that you have with them. So just remember the importance of listening when that person sits in front of you. Hi, I'm Dr. Nalini Chilkov. I specialize in integrative oncology. I'm here at a conference learning about autoimmunity. A lot of people think that autoimmune disease and cancer are similar or linked, but the thing that links them is actually inflammation. In cancer, we want to stimulate and tonify the immune system to go after the cancer, but when we have autoimmune disease, we want to actually tone down the immune system. So we have a challenge there. You can use the Chinese medicinal mushroom, Ganoderma, in patients who are comorbid for both autoimmune disease as well as cancer because the Ganoderma mushroom, the great reishi mushroom, can be used safely with autoimmune patients because it also is very anti-inflammatory. It's important not to use the other medicinal mushrooms like Coriolis and Cordyceps. The dose of Ganoderma is about three grams a day. Hi, my name is Dr. Rika. I founded the Simply Health Institute in Naperville, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. My top tip is to create a system model that allows patients to succeed. For me and my practice and my patients, it was a program model that allows me to support a patient throughout. It includes four visits with me, four visits with my health coach. They can opt in for the personal training sessions because I'm part of a facility that has a medical fitness gym right on site. They get a heart math sensor, a cookbook, and a lifestyle binder. 
every patient that's gone through this has shown tremendous amount of impro improvement, if not complete uh, resolution of sim symptoms. This is unheard of. In the past, patients were not succeeding. They weren't, a portion of them weren't supported and they had no idea how to implement this. So my top tip is implement a program model to ensure your patients succeed. So one of the things that Terry Walls contributed to our Practice Accelerator community is still reverberating through that community today. When Dr. Walls came onto our, one of our expert calls a couple of years ago, she shared about how the power of community had transformed her ability to reproduce the great work that she was doing in groups of people through a group visit method. Now, Dr. Lara Salia heard that talk and started to create her own way of using groups to be able to bring people into functional medicine through a group visit intake. And one of the things that we have done is put that as part of our Practice Accelerator program. So if you're interested in doing a group visit, go to goevomed.com slash brochure, check out the Practice Accelerator and come and join us. But I want to take the conversation a little bit further than we've ever taken it here at the Functional Forum and talk about the creation of community groups. You know, whenever I go on summits or interviews or otherwise and I'm asked, what's your best tip for people who want to recover from chronic illness? I always talk about you've got to find other people who are like you and particularly those people who have recovered from a chronic illness already through functional medicine have so much to offer to their local community. And so later this month, we're actually going to be bringing out a program to help practitioners, health coaches, office managers, or just people who are passionate about the evolution of medicine to build local support groups, get people into support groups, talk about the kind of lifestyle changes that have been spoken about in these meetups and through all the content you've ever seen on the Functional Forum, and to connect like-minded people together, and then eventually to connect those people to the functional medicine practices all across the country that can really help these people. This kind kind of grassroots activism is what can make a difference to get more and more people into the offices of functional medicine doctors and if you're interested in participating in that at a grassroots level we already have the tools like Facebook and Eventbrite and Meetup to be able to get people together let's shuffle and shuttle that demand into functional medicine practices all across the country if you're interested in finding out more watch this space check out the emails it'll be coming along soon if you're a clinician that wants to be part of the most innovative group connection in functional medicine for building sustainable practices Go to goevomed.com slash brochure and check out the Practice Accelerator. We'll see you the next clip. Hi, I'm Tracy Harrison, the founder of the School of Applied Functional Medicine. And my tip for all the practitioners out there is just how epidemic uh, autoimmune thyroiditis or even functional hypothyroid is. Uh, in today's culture. And uh, I like to say sluggish thyroid, sluggish everything. So, so often uh, the different dysfunctional biochemistry that uh, patients and clients are struggling with is about mitochondrial dysfunction, right? Suboptimal cellular metabolism. And we need to not lose sight of the fact that thyroid hormone for that is crucial. And so much of the true upstream root cause driver, at least one big one that people are struggling with is suboptimal thyroid function on a cellular level. So don't forget to look for that making sure we don't miss an important puzzle piece. It's Dr. Tetlow from Philadelphia Integrative Medicine, just outside of Philly. I'm here at the annual conference for IFM, and I got a great provider tip from a neighboring poster. I was presenting my poster and just two posters down. Someone was talking about patients with low B12, low ferritin, and they introduced autoimmune gastritis. So this is a diagnosis I don't often think about, but it's very easy to test for, antiparietal antibody. And um, I'm also gonna use the uh, IFM toolkit on uh, HCL challenge, just to assess uh, low HCL and, and acid. So it's a great thing to add to my differential diagnosis. Hi, my name is Fazana. I'm a nutritional therapist and I work out of London. My practice tip is, always retell the patient's story to the patient. Go through it with them again, because as you do that, it can trigger a memory, it can trigger some information that they will remember, and it can be a really vital piece of the puzzle. Um, and it's, there's always something that comes up when you retell the story, so that would be my tip. 
Hi, I'm Dr. Jason Bradley, founder and CMO of Epic Functional Medicine Center in Iowa City, Iowa. My one minute tip uh, to improve your health, especially if you have autoimmunity, is to focus on your diet. I've been fortunate enough to practice with Dr. Terry Walls for a couple of years now at Epic. And the thing that I can take away is the more effort that we put into dietary management, um, the better people feel and the quicker symptoms resolve. We try to keep diet very simple for our autoimmune clients. Um, you know, what we recommend is plenty of vegetables. Um, I'd recommend the walls uh, th uh, three, three cups each of greens, colors, and uh, cruciferous vegetables, healthy fats and proteins, berries if you want to sweet, and keep yourself very hydrated. But keep it that simple and you'll feel better. So each year here at the annual international conference, there's an award given out called the Linus Pauling Award, which is essentially a lifetime achievement award in functional medicine. And this year's winner is someone who I have called before the unstoppable Dr. Terry Walls. Now she's been on the functional forum a couple of times before, but we caught up with her in light of her award to find out where she's taking her project next to bring her brand of autoimmune reversal to the masses. Check out the interview. So first, Dr. Walls, congratulations on the Thank award. You. I know it's the Thank biggest you. award in functional medicine and so well deserved. Um, coming all the way from your own personal story to now touching the lives of, of millions of other people. So I know that MS was your particular diagnosis. Uh, how do you feel that MS relates to all the other autoimmune diseases that are being discussed this weekend? You know, it, it's uh, just another variation. We need to address the root causes of why the immune uh, system becomes dysfunctional. Uh, and so it's just another one of the many common causes for severe disability related to uh, autoimmunity. So more in common than Far different. more in common, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in that regard, you know, one of the things I'd love to get into, you, I know a lot of people on the Functional Forum have heard your story before, but now in the last few years it's been about how do we reproduce this and at scale. Yes. So what are some of the things that you've learned along the way and how to re uh, reproduce this individually for clinicians and, and some of the other ways you've been doing it? Well, uh, in my clinical practice for years, I was at the VA and we ran this in terms of group classes uh, and that was very, very effective. Uh, that way you could uh, reach out, identify uh, clinicians that want to refer to you, interested patients, uh, and put them together, because there was only me initially. Uh, that expanded the group considerably. Uh, and uh, now I have a small private uh, practice, again, reaching out to subspecialists who are wanting to refer patients who are interested in a diet and lifestyle approach so you can get the right people who are willing to go on this journey with you. And what are, the, what are some of the value of the group dynamics? Uh, what I love about the group dynamics is the peer-to-peer -peer coaching and teaching that happens. Uh, you know, we can give them the information, but helping them understand how they do it in their life, how they can do it with other farmers, other small town folks who are trying to figure out how do I get this food in my local hy V, my local grocery store. Um, how do I do this socially with other friends? Uh, that peer-to-peer -peer connection is so useful because with any health behavior change, it's about adopting and sustaining these health behaviors and peer-to-peer -peer is far more effective. Yeah, and what, what have you found with, I know, you know, making dietary changes is not as simple as just one change. It can be learning to cook, it can be a lot of things that have to happen. What are the, the ways that you found to sort of stimulate that in groups? So uh, group cooking classes are, are very helpful, doing cooking demonstrations, serving them examples of the food, uh, taking them out on a group uh, uh, shopping expedition, learning about uh, shopping. So these kinds of skills are very helpful, uh, going to a restaurant, modeling uh, how you order food, uh, chat with your wait staff, uh, how to select what restaurant, uh, how to, uh, in a group, talk about and practice uh, calling your friends, your family, uh, to discuss uh, your dietary needs or strategies to bring the food uh, to your social gatherings. It's such a big point because I think that a lot of people when they end up facing the fact that they're going to have to make these changes end up like slightly socially isolated because they well, can't eat all the fun that's things. Right. We, have, we have to teach them how to uh, reimagine these social encounters and how because we don't want them to become isolated and lonely because yeah. that's an adverse health uh, risk as well. Absolutely. So what would be some of your, you know, we've been collecting one minute tips from practitioners who have been hearing things at the interview, uh, during the lectures, you know, for, for, for practitioners out there who are like, you know, they know, they've either experienced themselves or in patients that they can reverse autoimmune disease with, uh, with functional medicine approaches. What are some of the top tips that you have for our community at home to, to replicate your work with MS, but more generally with autoimmune? Uh, you really want to um, help people connect it to their purpose 
So what is their life mission? What is their life purpose? What do they want their health for? So they're wanting to do the work. Uh, and then uh, identify a health coach in your community to help with that behavioral change. So health coaches are, are, are strong for you? Are, are very helpful. Uh, are very helpful. I begin to have that conversation, what do you want your health for? Uh, do they have a life purpose, a life mission? And then I can relate uh, the reason to go on this journey as to their uh, mission, their purpose. When does that purpose uh, add the most value? Is it when, when patients get sort of stuck uh, at the first hurdle or the second hurdle? Yeah. Most value in your first visit with them. Wow. What do they want their health for? It's part of that relationship building, uh, that connection with them, uh, so they're willing to go on that journey with you. And have you found that that's something that people are willing to share in a group environment? Uh, yes, you know, actually it's my, uh, our most popular class uh, is the uh, life purpose, what you want your health for. Absolutely, yeah. No, I think uh, so many clinicians and practitioners uh, have told us that you know, connecting patients to purpose helps them you know, sort of keep momentum through the training protocol, especially when, when uh, the changes can be overwhelming. The, the changes are very hard. You know, think about the last time you had a, a, a health behavior a bad habit you wanted to break, that was not an easy task. No. Or a new health habit you wanted to acquire, yeah. that's also not an easy task. Uh, and I think we have to be uh, humble as we reflect on our own lives, how challenging that is. And we're asking our patients to do something every bit as hard. Uh, so having a coach, having a, uh, a process, having a purpose, really makes that far, far easier. Absolutely, yeah, we've talked a lot about coaching, community, and content as the sort of the three C's that need to happen sort of outside of the clinic. And you obviously got the Walls Protocol, the book. I mean, that's a great compendium. And then having these groups and communities and coaching, putting it yes, all together. Right. That, you know, one of the things I'd love to, to, I know the last time you spoke at the Functional Forum, you talked about sort of this journey from being kind of unaccepted, what your work in the VA, to now being, you know, more accepted. And then yes. other health systems really looking at this and going, wow, like this seems to be working at scale. How do you see your work making it into the larger health system at the well, moment and in the future? You know, uh, so right now, the National uh, uh, Multiple Sclerosis Society, if you look back at my experience with them, in 2009, I was banned for creating false hope. Uh, but in 2016, they awarded uh, $1.5 million to my lab to study a, a parallel group design a research project looking at the Walls diet. That's a very rapid uh, period uh, change. So change is happening. It is being accepted. You have certainly seen more neurologists getting on board with diet and lifestyles being really important, uh, and that diet needs to be studied. Uh, and in fact, we're also hearing from more neurologists that they are referring patients uh, to us uh, and to dietitians to learn about the Walls diet. So it is happening, it will continue to happen, it will continue to happen at ever faster rates. So it's funny that you mention neurologists because about five years ago when I lived in New York, uh, I decided to go and have a beer with someone who I would consider an internet troll um, of, of my website and he would come on and write very angry remarks about things and I found out he was a neurologist and uh, you know in the conversation it came up you know we, we had a lot in common it doesn't yes. turned out um, but you know he one of his frustrations was that you know he would have patients that would come in sort of expecting that he was capable of reversing MS because they had read the book or otherwise and I think maybe it really came from a sort of a, like a knowledge deficit in a certain way yeah. that he didn't really know what to do. And, um, you know, I, I would love to get your thoughts on that because it's, it's evolving so quickly that now I'm so glad to hear well, neurologists are coming on board. So uh, some people are, are excited. Uh, they want to implement the protocol and then they're, uh, just, they experience fatigue reduction, cognitive improvement, mood improvement, but they still have motor deficits uh, and uh, they're upset and angry and frustrated. And uh, motor... Uh, it takes a lot longer, uh, it takes a lot of physical work, uh, uh, it takes some training. People may or may not be willing to do that. Yeah. Uh, and so in my practice, I try to talk about what their goals, what their expectations are, and lay out that the cognitive mood comes quickly, motor comes uh, much more slowly, uh, a lot of work, and a lot more time. Uh, it's, it can happen, but it is a much slower process. And what are the things that help in that, that part of the journey, particularly the motor? Are there other practitioners that a functional medicine provider needs to bring in to help them? Uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, depending on the circumstances, uh, neuromuscular electrical stimulation might be helpful, uh, 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 physical uh, rehab, uh, a, uh, uh, a uh, weight suspended uh, gait training uh, device, 
so all of that uh, could be helpful. Awesome. You know, one of the things that, that I want to, to just share as being an inspiration for us is, is the creation of groups. And, you know, we just see that with all of, you know, what you've shared of, of how powerful the, the group dynamic is. It seems to me that, you know, if, uh, if we could create groups of patients with similar diagnoses in cities and towns all across the country and share this content into that community, you know, we could get far more people ending up in functional medicine doctors offices uh, where they have a, they have a chance of, of, of that coming together. You know, one of the things I, I remember you saying is just how much of a difference it makes that, you know, how, how credible someone who's had a reversal mm -hmm. is compared mm -hmm. to a physician. And, you know, I'd love yes, to just see yes. how, you, how you see that sort of growing now that you have some more flexibility in private practice? So, you know, I, I certainly have uh, in, in uh, the internet uh, social media platforms, you know, we have thousands and you know, hundreds of thousands of followers. So there are those vehicles that are out there. Um, uh, there'll no doubt be more entrepreneurs who will figure that out. Uh, we've created uh, membership programs and some online interactive support to provide uh, more access for people who are wanting to have more uh, support uh, virtually. Uh, so that that's an area that we're exploring to see wh what other additional remote products can we create to provide greater support. And, and I think uh, there are more functional medicine practitioners and, and we're all sort of thinking about uh, from an entrepreneur's side, what can we do virtually to help create this community uh, and provide support in a way that is sustainable for us and the community. What part of the protocol that you're recommending is is only to be done by the functional medicine doctor, credentialed labs, that, that, and what part of it is done by like a sort of um, you know health coach or ancillary sort of uh, other provider? Well, you know the health behavior. Uh, so you've already prescribed the diet. Uh, now the the question is how do I operationalize that into my life uh, uh, and begin to make these specific changes, learning how to cook. Uh, making these uh, changes in my stress reduction uh, ha habits. Health coach can do that. Uh, primary care, how do I, as I implement this stuff uh, and adjust my blood pressure meds, my uh, uh, mood medication, my diabetic meds, primary care can do that. Uh, uh, how's my homocysteine? Uh, primary care could do that. Uh, if I'm still not getting the results that I'm looking for based on you know, the kind of guidance that I have in the WALS protocol, uh, and you've optimized the homocysteine, optimized the vitamin D, optimized your insulin, uh, then finding a dietitian who could help you assess how really reliable are you with implementing the diet, finding a functional medicine doc who may need to investigate further uh, uh, new, um, nutritional status or microbiome status. Uh, so I, I, in my book, I try to provide you know, tiered levels of what kind of professional help you need and at what point do you, do you need to go to a primary care doc or a functional medicine doc who can do more comprehensive about. So I know that you know, there's a lot of uh, you know, great thinkers here at this conference and uh, probably people that you've you know, learned from as you, you go along. What are, what are some of the things that you've learned this conference? So, so far this morning, we've been talking a lot about the microbiome. Uh, and, uh, an interesting point is the uh, load of the uh, fungus in the microbiome and the virus in the microbiome is just beginning to be understood. I think there's a whole lot more for us to learn there. And we're also just beginning to understand what the role of the helminth is uh, in the uh, uh, protozoans. So I'll be really very excited to see that research of all. And now that you have sort of, tell us a little bit about your own practice situation, because I know that you're not the VA and now working in yes, private yes. practice. What does that Okay, look like? so uh, half time I'm doing my research. Uh, one day a week I'm doing my own uh, private practice, which is a concierge practice. Uh, we give people six months uh, worth of support, uh, initial intake, and then uh, group visits after that. Yep. Uh, and then uh, I have another uh, day a week where I'm devoted to developing the Walls Protocol Seminar, where people come. Uh, uh, learn about the protocol uh, for me for three days and I teach clinicians how to implement and utilize the protocol as part of their practice. Uh, so we've been growing that. Uh, we've got uh, people coming in from all over the globe. 
Yeah, is there a particular you know, part of the world where this seems to have like really caught on outside of obviously America and Iowa? Well, uh, you know, Canada is very big. Yeah. Uh, uh, UK is very big. And I also seem to have a lot of followers in Australia. So we have a number of folks coming over from Australia as well. That's wonderful. Well, Dr. Walls, I really want to just, you know, again, congratulate you for winning the award. But more than that, you know, uh, when you came on to our Practice Accelerator uh, a few years ago and, and gave the lecture about doing the groups, yes. it actually inspired a number of the people in the groups to really start to think about what are the parts of the functional medicine process that take a lot of time. And, um, and one of the things that came up was the intaking, you know, getting, yes. getting people into that. And we've seen the group intake concept start to take off. Um, and it's really started to, to save so much time for clinicians, give people a taste of functional medicine for a low cost, give them opportunities to start implement the right diet for them and to move forward. And, and I would say, you know, it's been, it's been wonderful to see that, um, you yeah. know, transform. That was a very, very effective uh, tool for us at the VA, that group intake. That worked out very, very well. All right, so we've been here with Dr. Terry Walls. We've been here at the Functional Forum, winner of the 2018 Linus Pauling Award. Thanks so much for being part of the Functional Forum again. Mwah. A great tip for everyone is to come to the IFM AIC. Here we've had a chance to have a whole day of pediatric autoimmune disease and treatments and discovery and tests, and it has been fantastic as well, of course, meeting with our cohorts who we trained with and some of our trainers and to spend some real time together. It's been a wonderful experience. I encourage everybody to try and come. Thanks so much for being with us. It has been incredible to be here at the Institute for Functional Medicine's annual conference to see so many friendly faces from all around the world participating in the meetup groups and coming here once a year together to get together with their tribe. Uh, for the rest of the summer, our functional forums are going to be coming live from the new Vision Tour as we go city to city across America to spread the word about functional medicine. I hope you'll be able to join us in person. Until I see you then, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.